Cause, a copyrighted program transcribed and dedicated to the prevention of crime. Calling all cars, attention all cars, broadcast 242 regarding an injured woman. Call an ambulance if needed. That is all. Gordon. Criminals realize, more or less, that at all costs they must leave little or no evidence of their crime. They realize that their safety depends upon that. They will go to any length in their anxiety to accomplish that end, even to the extent of committing another crime to cover up or destroy the visible evidence of the first crime. But in their twisted minds, they fail to realize that the second crime is left wide open with no covering whatsoever, and capture becomes inevitable. The police are trained to piece together evidence, isolated bits of proof. And once this is done, the crime is uncovered and its commission traced to the criminal. The true story you will now hear, taken from police records, the case of the man who talked. In the police station, a group of officers are passing the tedious hours of their shift playing dominoes. Okay, Louie. Here's your chance to even up the score. If I had luck like yours, I wouldn't be a copper. That's all right. You don't need luck. You just need to know how to play dominoes. Give me ten. I'll take fifteen. Hmm. Guess our fire laddies are going to have a little fun. Yeah. I wish they'd move that fire station out of our police headquarters. I'm getting tired of hearing those sirens every time there's a brush fire somewhere in this town. Yeah, they are a little noisy. Now, give me five. Five for me. San Pedro Division, Captain Gentry speaking. Okay. All right, we'll look into it. And Fuller, Vigno, come here. Come okay, in. Captain. What's on your mind, Captain? I just got a telephone call from that fire location. They found a woman in the house who apparently has been injured. They've sent her in. Uh, where was the fire? On 4th Street. Hmm, not far, huh? How is she injured? I don't know. I think she was unconscious when they found her. Uh, smoke victim? Maybe. You boys get on upstairs. You can find out when Doc Langland examines her. Okay, Captain. Let me know what you find out. Uh, I never got started on a game of dominoes that something didn't happen. Well, that's all right. That'll give you time to think up some new plays. Maybe you can win this game. Yeah, maybe if we'd stop having fires and getting calls on drunks falling down in the gutter and a few things like that. Well, why don't you give up your exalted position? I like the work. Hello, boys. What's on your mind? Uh, Captain Gentry wants us to check up on a woman they brought in from the fire. Might be a good idea at that. We're just getting it prepared in the operating room. Let's go in. All right. Hmm. Probably just a smoke victim. I'm not so sure. Looks like she's been injured some way. Hmm. She's no smoke victim, Doc. Look at that face. Well, this woman's hair is a mass of blood. There's something fishy here. Tom, I think we'd better take a run out to that fire. 
Hello, fellas. Captain Gentry wants to know what you found out. Oh, hi, Richardson. There isn't anything we can find out here. Something or somebody's given this woman a terrific beating. How she looked, Doc? Pretty bad. You know who she is? Nope. No report on her. Just an ambulance call sheet. We're just fixing to go out there. Want to come along? Yeah, I guess so. I'll get the address off the call sheet. See you down there. seem to be much of a fire. Oh, here comes Charlie Carroll. Maybe he knows what this is all about. Hi, boys. How was that woman that we sent down? I don't know yet. Looks like she's in pretty bad shape. Who was she? Well, let me look at my notebook here. I see uh, Mrs. Margaret Henniger, age 50. Well, where'd you find her? We found her lying on a bed in the front room. Thought at first she'd been overcome by smoke, but I saw she was bleeding pretty badly from the mouth, so I sent her down to the receiving hospital in an ambulance. Yeah, we saw her. She's still unconscious. Well, uh, was she here alone? No, her husband was here. He's around somewhere. He was asleep in the living room. Imagine he can give you more details. Where is he now? Yeah, he's in the house somewhere. Well, might as well talk to him. Howdy, gentlemen. Are you Mr. Hanniger? That's me. Well, looks like you had a little trouble around here. Yeah, there was quite a lot of excitement for a while. Tell me, have you seen my wife? Yeah, we've seen her. How is she? Well, she seems pretty badly cracked up right now. You're a police officer, ain't you? Yes, we're just making a routine investigation. After we got the information about your wife being hurt, we thought we ought to look into the situation. Yes, sir. Uh, sit down, gentlemen. I got some cigarettes somewhere. Uh, here, take one of mine. Oh, thanks. Now, look, Mr. Hanniger, try to tell us what happened, how your wife got hurt. Well, when I got in from work this evening, I found out supper wasn't ready. So naturally, I wondered where my wife was. And did she always have supper ready when you got home? Yeah, most of the time. Uh, what time did you get home? Oh, it was about six o'clock, I guess, when I got in. Mm. And what did you do when you didn't find your wife in the house? Well, naturally, I went through the house calling her, but she didn't answer. So I thought maybe she was out in the backyard. What made you think that? Well, we got a rock garden out there with benches and chairs. I thought maybe she was sitting out there waiting for me. Maybe too tired to fix supper, so we'd go out. We do that sometimes. Mm-hmm. Then what? Well, it was getting pretty dark about then, so I went out there and I stepped off the porch rather hurriedly. I almost tripped over Margie, laying there right in the walk, just a little ways from the steps. Laying on the walk? Yes, sir. She seemed to be hurt some way. I thought she'd fainted, but when I started to lift her up, I saw a pool of blood under her head. Her face was covered with blood, too. I figured she'd slipped accidentally on the back steps and struck her head on that cement on the side of the walk. Well, what did you do then? Well, I picked her up and brought her in the house and put her on the bed there, in the front bedroom. I was going to call a doctor. Well, but... Why didn't you? Well, I... Well, you see, she was... Uh... I looked her over rather hurriedly, and I saw she was just suffering from nosebleed. But it seemed to be clearing up, so I just decided to leave her covered up with a blanket there for a while. And I figured when she rested a little, she'd be all right. Weren't you concerned about that nosebleed? Well, no. You see, she often has that. The doctor says she's susceptible to it or something like that. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people are. Uh, go ahead, Miss Anniger. Uh, what did you do then? Well, of course, the excitement and everything upset me a little. I was sort of stunned finding Margie out there in the yard and all like that. So naturally, I didn't feel like eating then. So I decided to sit down here in the living room, rest a while, and see what I could do for her after. Well, I guess I must have dozed off or something, because the next thing I knew, the yard was full of people. Everybody was yelling fire, and there was... Smoke coming into the room from the closet back there. I guess by the time I was on my feet and wide awake, the firemen were here. And did you go out to see where the fire was? I don't remember whether I did or not. Anyway, they found the wife just after they got here, rushed her off to the hospital. I ain't had much time to do anything around here. I was just trying to clean the place up when you fellas came. You think she's hurt bad? Well, we don't know yet. The doctor's still working on her. Did you uh, throw any water on your wife or wash your face or anything to bring her out of her faint when you found her? No, I didn't. Why not? Well, I'll tell you. You see, Margie had been drinking a little. She'd found a bottle I had here in the house, and I think she took a little too much. What do you mean by that? Well, I don't think she really fainted. I think she just lost her balance and fell. Say, come on out. I'll show you where she was when I found her. She was right there by the walk. Mm -hmm. There's some broken fragments of glass of some kind. Yeah, uh, that's the bottle. 
Margie had it in the front of her dress, hiding it. And it broke when she fell on the walk. You got a paper sack around here anywhere? Yeah, I, I think there's one right here. This one big enough? I think so. I just want to pick this glass up. There was a lot of blood on the walk there close to the porch, but it seems to be gone now. I wonder what became of it. Well, by the time I got out here, there was dozens of people running around the yard hollering fire. I didn't clean up anything, but it seems like they must have trampled everything out. It was right there, just about three feet from them steps. Yeah, there is a discoloration here of some kind. Looks like it's been pretty well walked over, though. And maybe we better look around the rest of the house. Uh, did you hear any noise in the front part of the house? No, I didn't hear a thing. I was so dog tired and sleepy, I guess couldn't have heard much. Was the front door locked? No, I don't think so. I came in that way, but I don't remember whether I locked it or not. I wonder yeah, if well, I... we'll check on that later. How about that fire? How'd it start? Well, you see, it started from defective wiring out there in that closet off the back porch. You see, the wires lead out across the backyard, and somebody had hung some washing on them. Either Margie or one of the neighbors. You know, I've always been warning her about that. And I remember just before I found Margie, I noticed there were some heavy blankets hanging on those wires. I didn't notice any clothes out there a while ago. Oh, no, no. They disappeared during the excitement about the fire. That's what makes me think they belong to some of the neighbors. They must have come out and got them when the fire broke out. So the blankets pulled the wires down and shorted them, eh? That's the only way I can figure it out. Well, let's have a look at that closet. You say your wife's nose was bleeding when you picked her up? Yeah. Well, not much, though. When we saw her down at the receiving hospital, she was bleeding from the mouth. Is this where the fire was? Yes, sir. Mm. You think the fire department got here when it did, or you wouldn't have much of a house now. Uh, Mr. Henniger, uh, I wish you'd show us where your wife was when the fireman got here. Why, she was right in the front room. That is, the front bedroom. I carried her in there and laid her down in the bed. Have you got a phone? Why, yes, sir. Right out there in the hall. I think I'll call the station and see how your wife's getting along. Say, I, I wish you would. I'm worried about her. Now, here's the room right here. Is uh, this the bed you put her on? Yes, sir. Looks like she was hurt pretty badly, judging from the appearance of this bed. Well, she wasn't when I brought her in. At least she didn't seem to be. You sure you didn't hear anybody come in while you were dozing in the other room? No, sir, I didn't hear a soul. But I, I can't understand how Margie was hurt so bad. Yeah, I was wondering about that, too. I just talked to Doc Langan. Oh, how is Margie? Apparently not so good. They just transferred her to the general hospital. Oh, if I'd only come home a little earlier, I might have kept this from happening. For two days, Margaret Henniger hovered between life and death. Then, on the last day of December, she died without regaining consciousness. Lieutenant Vigneault was sent to break the news to the woman's husband, while Richardson and Fuller drove to the county morgue. Hi, Bill. We want to see the chart on Mrs. Henniger. Yep, here you are. I can't believe that woman was drunk. She doesn't look to me like a woman who was in the habit of drinking. I was just thinking the same thing. Say, Bill, this chart doesn't show any chest injuries or any cuts. We list the injuries as we find them, no more, no less. What's the autopsy report? Concussion of the brain caused by some external force. That's our cue to begin work, White. Richardson and Fuller drove back to the Henniger home, determined to make a careful survey of the premises. Doesn't seem to be anyone around. Yeah, I guess the old man's making a funeral arrangement. You know, it just occurred to me that some of the neighbors around there could have seen anything that might have happened to Mrs. Henniger. I'd say that vacant lot there is about 50 feet, wouldn't you? Yeah, just about. Well, those people in that apartment house could have seen anything that happened in this backyard here. Those wires are low enough for a clothesline, all right, but... Wait a minute. There's a clothesline with clothespins on it. Ah. Say, this doesn't make sense. I want to take a pull on those, uh, those light wires. Well, I don't think they give an inch. Hey, these wires are fastened to this big insulator here with tie wires. Well, you couldn't pull them loose if you swung on them. Besides, they don't go directly into the house. They're lead-in wires through a condo. Things don't jibe here. Look, I got a passkey. Let's uh, take a look in this house. Now, let's inspect that closet again. Blaze didn't start close to those wires. Started several feet down in the closet. Mm-hmm. Now, let's take a look at that bedroom. Say, 
Say, this place looks like it had been cleaned up. Yeah, Henniger said some of the neighbors were going to help him clean the place. Wait a minute. Now, where's the mattress? What mattress? The mattress that was on that bed. I know Don Willow was there last night. I saw it. Had blood on it. Well, we'll probably find out when Henniger gets here. He may have sent it out to be cleaned. Yeah, he may have. Well, come on, let's go outside. I want to look at the yard again. Well, this here's been a pretty nice little place at one time or another. Probably worth a lot more than the old man paid for it. Oh, wait. Here comes Henniger around the side of the house. Hmm. I want to ask him about that mattress. Good morning, boys. Good morning, Henniger. I guess you come to tell me about Margie, too, huh? Well, I know already. One of the other officers was here and told me. Yeah, that's why we're here. Before we can close the files on this case, there are a few things we'd like to clear up. I'll help you all I can. Are you sure you didn't hear any noise or commotion or any kind of a struggle in the bedroom that night? No. Guess I was too sleepy. I was just so tired and worn out. Hey, you wouldn't happen to know what neighbor hung her clothes on the light wire back here. No, I don't. I warned Margie lots of times about it, but she was too soft-hearted to say anything to him. I see. What became of the mattress on the bed where you placed your wife the other night? Mattress? Yes, there's no mattress there now. Well, I don't know. Some of the neighbor women were cleaning up around here. They must have taken it away, but I don't know what they could have done with it. You know who cleaned up that room? No, I don't. Well, we'll keep looking around, see what we can turn up on the case. We'll be seeing you from time to time. Leaving the bereaved husband, the officers started a round of questioning in the neighborhood to ascertain who had used the power wires for a clothesline and who had helped clean up the Henniger home. Back at headquarters, Richardson, Fuller, and Vigneault discussed the developments in the case. I can't help but think that Henniger hasn't told us all he knows about this deal. I'm inclined to think the same thing, especially since we couldn't find anybody who had been hanging clothes on the wires or anybody who helped clean up the house. You know, that guy may be old and stooped and bowed with grief, but physically, he's a pretty hefty old goat. Yeah, he's no weakling. A ship's carpenter has to be able to do fairly heavy work. And besides, I've watched that old man while you boys were asking him questions. He may seem to think slow and move slow, but his eyes are shifty. You give him plenty of rope, and he's going to give you a clue as to who killed that woman. You know something else has been puzzling me? Remember that woman that we talked to this morning, the one we asked if any of the neighbors ever called on Henniger? Yeah, I noticed that. Yeah, she sure made me feel like a fool when she suggested that if we thought he was so lonesome and was interested in how he spent his evenings, why didn't we call on him? Yeah, it's the simple things in life that we miss. Hey, Louis, what makes you think the old man's concealing something? Well, I've been watching him. He doesn't act like a man whose wife has just been murdered. At least not the way I think he should act. Oh, Louis, I think you expect too much of the old guy. What possible motive could he have for covering things up? I don't know, but I still think he knows who did this. And I think if we keep a close enough watch on him, he'll lead us to the guy we're looking for. Well, maybe you have something there. Let's wait and see. Twenty-four hours a day, officers of the homicide squad kept Henniger under surveillance, hoping that he would furnish some clue that would lead them to the murderer of his wife. And one day, Vigneault and Fuller decided to look over the ground again. Come on, Louis. What are you looking for now? A mattress. Still looking for that mattress, eh? Yeah. Let's start with this vacant lot. There's a rubbish heap out there. I'm going to dig around in it. You don't have to dig. Here, on this trash heap. Oh, oh, a piece of an old mattress. And unless I'm badly mistaken, those brown spots are blood. Mm, that's funny. Yeah, too funny. Let's go over and inspect Henniger's garage. You don't suppose that mattress has been laying around here all the time? Well, Henniger told us that one of the neighbors took that mattress out. It wouldn't make sense that the neighbor had kept it laying around in that condition until now. I got a hunch. Well, it looks to me like your hunch was right. Mm-hmm, it looks that way. There's a mark on the floor that could have been made when a mattress was dragged over into that corner. If you ask me, I don't think these spots on the floor got there accidentally. You mean the mattress was left here? I do. And I'm going to find out why. Quiet. Here comes the old man now. You guys still snooping out here, huh? Yeah, we're still uh, checking. We'll have to keep on with the work until we're satisfied. All right. Help yourself. I'd like to ask you some more questions. Yeah, I know. You're officers, and you've got to hold your jobs. Well, let's sit down here on the bench. All right. Go ahead. Let's we get it over with. We'd like to know what you did with that mattress you took off the bed the night your wife was beaten up. Mattress? Yeah, mattress. I told you once there was no mattress. 
Just blankets on the bed, and that's that. Anything else? What have you been burning in that rubbish pile back of the garage? Burn? Nothing. Who said I have? We're asking you. Why, that ash pile is a community dump. All the neighbors dump their stuff there and burn it. Well, we found a piece of a mattress there, and it's had blood on it. We found evidence in your garage that something had lain in the corner and had been dragged out toward that fire. And that something left dark brown stains on the garage floor. Well, if there was anything in that garage, it's news to me. Seems to me if you fellas spent less time hanging around here and more time looking for the guy that killed my wife, you'd probably do a better job. You know, you may have something there. We'll think it over. More certain than ever now that Henniger was hiding something, the officers continued their investigation. They were at a loss to find a reason for his unwillingness to talk. Henniger went about his work, occasionally dropped into a cafe for a glass of beer, but apparently talked to no one. Nor did anyone call at the house on 4th Street. Henniger seemed to spend his evenings alone. Then Sergeant Richardson remembered the cryptic remark of Henniger's neighbor. Well, now, what makes you think he's so lonesome in the evening? Well, the light's on. He's there alone, isn't he? Well, maybe the light's there, and maybe that's all that is there. You're so interested in how he spends his evening. Why don't you call on him yourself and help him pass the time away? Late in the afternoon of the following day, the officers made sure that Henniger had come home from work. They shadowed him to his house and continued to cruise around until dusk. Did you see him go in the house, Louis? Yeah, he went in all right. There goes the light on the living room. What time is it? Uh, 7.28. Let's park and wait. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wonder what that day meant. I don't know, but I'm going to find out if I have to camp on this guy's trail until I get my retirement pension. Hey, you don't suppose he beat up his wife, do you? That old guy? Nah. But he's not telling the truth about who did. Maybe he doesn't know. You can't tell me that he could sit there in the front room while somebody came in and beat up a woman like that without him knowing something about it. Well, the neighbors still claim they didn't see anything. We haven't got any reason to suppose that they would see what happened in the bedroom. Now, wait a minute. He's coming out. See him there on the front porch? Yeah, and he's left the light on. So that's the game, huh? Mm Mm-hmm. So he goes out at night and leaves the light burning, eh? Well, he's a wasteful old coot, isn't he? (laughs) Yeah, let's follow him. Give him a chance to get on the block of face. I wonder where that guy's going at this time of night. Seems to have a pretty definite idea of what he wants to do. Hmm. Looks like he's going down Beacon Street. Yeah. Let's see the car here. We can follow him on foot. See where he went? Yeah. Yeah, he went in that hotel right down the block there. What do you know about that? I thought they closed that place up. <laughs> so did I. Want to knock the dump over? Yeah. Uh, we're after Henniger. Okay, let's get up there. like they'd put carpet on these places. Oh, no, you couldn't hear the cops coming, then. Hey, what do you guys want to make so much noise for? It's not like a herd of cattle. Pleasant voice, Dame, isn't she? Just hold your horses, lady. Oh, coppers, huh? I might have known it. You all sounded flat-footed. Well, what do you want? Now, look, sister, don't flare up. Won't do you any good. You stick right here in the front office. We want Henniger. Yeah? What do you want with him? Just a free tip, sister. You play ball with us unless you want a stiffer rep than you're going to get. Where'd that guy go? In the third room down the hall. Okay, we're going down there. And don't you try to tip him off. You stay right where you are. And don't be phoning anybody. Oh, there ain't no phone in that room. Wait a minute. Let's take a listen. Well, honey, I got the money, eh? Yeah? How much? Enough to do us for a while. What do you mean, us? Well, we're going to get married, ain't we? Oh, yeah. Sure. How'd you get the money? Check or cash? I got a check, but I cashed it this morning. Got it with you? Yes, sir. Here she is right here. 2,700 bucks. I thought you said there were 3000 Well, I had to bury the dame, didn't I? Yeah, I guess so. What about the house? That's mine, too. And the apartment house next to it, and that vacant lot alongside. She had a lot of money when I married her. Took you a long time to get it. Yeah, but you know how she was. She was a stubborn woman. You took an awful lot of risk for what you got out of. Ah, where's the risk? Nobody suspects me. I hope not. How'd you do it? Heck, it was easy. I came home that night, and she was out on the back porch, sitting in a chair. I walked up behind her and let her have it with a bottle right in the back of the head. Didn't it cut her? No. The bottle broke, though, and I threw it out in the yard. She fell down out there and started yelling her head off. So I had to kick her till she stopped. Then I took her in and threw her on the bed in the front room. Then I went out and set them clothes afire in the closet. That's all we want to know, Henniger. Get your coat and come on.
just a moment, you will hear the summation of our story. The criminal in this case, Henniger, was of a peculiarly stupid type. His plea that he had been framed by the police officers proved that. He was duly indicted and tried for murder. The jury found him guilty as charged, and he paid the penalty as prescribed by the court. Another case of an attempt to cover one crime with another, and of course it failed, thus proving that crime does not pay. All cars, attention all cars, cancellation broadcast 242. Suspect now in custody. That is all. Gordon. <laughs>